to ask Maniza. Super stoked to uh, bring you a very special guest today. It is Dr. Wynn Fan, also known as MD with Spirit. And I hope that you'll come catch us um, and talk to us and share your questions. Um, because I know we have a lot of questions posted already and we'd love to help you answer them. And I know some of the questions are not um, um, super doctor fan friendly, so, but some of them are because he's a doctor and we want to ask him, um, uh, you know, MD friendly questions. So we'll do our best to answer them between him and myself. <laughs> um, and go from there. So I'm super excited to welcome him. So I'm going to bring him on. Let's see. Here we go. Hello. Hey, Doctor. Can you hear me? Oh, hear you just fine. That's awesome. awesome. So, okay. <laughs> the technology is working. Hello and welcome. How are you doing, Doctor Fan? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing good. I'm I'm getting an IV, so uh, we're gonna have a little technical stuff, but uh, we're doing good and. Uh, I thought today's topic was guess if Dr. Fan's wearing pants. Is that? Is that <laughs> I, was, uh, I was hoping you'd come up with a topic. I was really struggling yeah. to come up with a topic, you know, how that goes, right? So um, we're excited to have you here. There's a lot of questions that I have on various channels. We have questions on Facebook. We have questions from Instagram. So I'm going to be doing my best to navigate those questions. So just... You know, while you're, well, welcome. You're the fir first time on this channel. Uh, and I would love for you to tell people a little bit about your background. Who are you? What kind of doctor are you? How did you get to where you are doing what you do? Well, like many of you guys know me, but again, just for those who are initiated, uh, I'm an internal medicine doctor uh, practicing in Spring, Texas, uh, gosh, for the last 20 something years now, I guess. Um, and I initially found medical meeting information because I was looking for answers through the alternative uh, medicine channels, let's say, right? Yeah. And I've, I went, like many of you here, I was looking for answers, and I think I went down wrong paths and uh, expensive paths and frustrating paths. And I just happened to be listening to Hay House Radio one day, and I was intrigued by Anthony on radio and he was talking to people and he was you know this the energy he gives out is kind of a humble kind of hey i want to help you know this is the thing and he, stuff came out of his mouth like i've never heard that before i just totally you know not of the alternative world but conventional world and it just intrigued me and so i uh, i uh started listening and got the book and got a session with him actually and um from you know kind of befuddled my way to where we're now where we're, we're still learning all of us are still learning uh, but, you know, you and I happen to have a bit more experience behind our ba uh, belts. Yeah, we've, um, we're always learning. I'm always learning. I literally have new cases come into the office every single day that are challenging, that are not quite what's exactly written about by the book, so to speak, literally by the book, right? Yeah. Um, right. I think... You have also seen many cases like that where it's not by the book and there's so much to figure out. I mean, health is complex, right? At the end of the day, health is complex. And the whole purpose of us coming together and talking and sharing more with the with people in this community, in the medical medium community, is to highlight that we really do need doctors. We need doctors. We need bridges between um, doctors and holistic the holistic world, the doctors and the natural world, doctors and, um, you know, nutrition advice. So I feel that there's a very special role that doctors, especially like you, play in the world and in, in helping people heal. And uh, we need more people like you. We need more doctors like you who are open to hearing something different than what they've been trained in. Now, I know that, you know, as if you are a medical professional, even if you are not a medical professional, actually, sometimes coming to information that is unique, that's different, that's kind of out there, 
happens because we have a personal experience that pushes us into that space. I know that was true for me. And I know that's been true for you as well, that, you know, you've, you've had to do it because you were taking care of family members and trying to help them. And so what you found in medicine wasn't enough. It wasn't cutting it. And so I'd love for you to, you know, share more about, was it easy to kind of walk away or explore something different? What was the reaction of your, um, you know, family members or friends or fellow doctors saying, hey, when, what are you doing? Um, well, you know, what was that like for you? Because we actually have quite a few questions that came on our threads asking you to share this part of your story. Oh, great. So um, I think I've, I've even before I started medical school, I, I in medical school, I was the president of the uh, Multicultural Association, uh, which, for, you know, which was kind of a thing for alternative medicine. I, I bring in acupuncturists and different people. Um, and so I've always had a kind of a, uh, you know, interest in alternative medicine. Uh, obviously, being Asian, you know, we have our own, you and I, we have our own like folk remedies and folk traditions and stuff like this. And so we've been exposed to that. And so we wanted, you know, going to medicine, you're like, I'm going to bring some legitimacy to some of this stuff and learn, you know, kind of the real reason why that happens or it helps and stuff like this. But um, when, when you go to the medical school, um, you tend to have to be a healthy person primarily, right? To get through medical, to get into medical school, to, to be a medical student, you're up all night, you're with the residents and you're basically this they call scut monkey where you're kind of like the, the gopher you do everything for them right right and you know you get verbally abused and stuff like this and and if you're if you're not healthy you're not probably going to get through it very well and so young doctors going to medical school they tend to be uh they tend to have this kind of like you know uh attitude that they can get through it just physically just push through it and stuff and we tend to do that uh, but until you get sick yourself or you have a family member who's sick you don't understand the experience of a sick person and it took my family member to, to kind of go south a little bit for me to kind of look into more things. And, you know, especially for being a professional, uh, sometimes a health professional, you're like, wow, I'm inadequate. I don't have enough information to, to take care of this thing. And so you go to other means. And this is where that's where my journey started, looking for uh, alternative information. And unfortunately, it, I think I did more harm than good. And Anthony kind of lays this out in his books and his talks that, you can actually do more harm. This misinformation is out there because it's kind of popular alternative medicine. And when you when when you read the books and you're like, oh God, that's exactly my experience. Or I, I see, I you know, I, I did this same thing and it didn't work out. Um, did my my colleagues? Did they did they look down on me or anything? Um, I don't know that they know how far deep I'm into the medical medium to really kind of say, yeah, you're kind of nuts. My partner does. My partner's pretty conventional. And he's just like, you do your thing, that's your niche, I'll do my thing. And we offer two different flavors at the office. So he's okay with that, right? Um, my family members, and I think many of you guys have the same experience, are like, oh, this is another one of your fa you know, phases where you're going to go through this. And how come, you know, well, you know, eight years later, we're still doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's why I say them, I, I've used this information to help other people. And so um, I'm not, it's not just a passing phase and I've actually, you know, seen it work and it explains a lot of the holes that we have to this day that we seeing in, in, in medicine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's so important because like Anthony says, or maybe like you thought yourself when you were a hospitalist or new fresh out of med school, seeing patients and you know, were you struggling? Like Anthony says, like doctors struggle with their patients. Were you struggling? Did you find yourself in the same position where, you know, you were seeing trends amongst your patients and whatever you were doing weren't, wasn't the answer? Yeah. And so I, um, I started going down the uh, thyroid path where I did a lot of thyroid stuff. And I had people from out of state come see me, even in, even out of country come see me. And I didn't have the answers. I and mean, they're like, how do I heal my thyroid without medication? Because I was just doling out thyroid hormones, uh, you name it, you know, compounded, pig thyroid, T4, T3, you know, Synthroid, all these different things. And I noticed that it never fixed the problem. I mean, it's like, and I said this before, I mean, you're going to get tired of me hearing saying this, is that thyroid hormone is like putting air in a flat tire. You can drive on the tire, but you never fix the tire. 
you keep on putting air in the thyroid, you put thyroid hormone in there. And no matter how much I cranked up the thyroid medicine, these ladies never lost weight. They didn't feel like they used to feel. So there was more to it. And so I kind of exhausted that alternative route where you're looking at, you know, you've heard of this, free T3, reverse T3, antibodies and adrenal and da, 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 da. Yes. And so when I started listening to Anthony stuff and, you know, thyroid hormone book, I mean, thyroid healing book, it was like, oh, okay, I, I see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. What was the biggest aha moment for you when you read the first medical medium book? The Epstein-Barr thing. I mean, that's like the, the kind of the um, infectious disease, the infectious disease kind of the, infectious theory of, of, uh, of disease, right? Because I had kind of you introduced that in medical school, like everything is an you know, infectious disease, right? You can, you can cure, you know, a UTI with antibiotics. Yeah, you can push it back, but it'll come back probably. Yeah. Um, but this whole Epstein-Barr thing and how it relates to what we thought was autoimmune disease, I was like, whoa, that's huge. You, sh you shift your perspective totally. Completely. It's like a it's like a complete paradigm shift because you start to I remember when I first heard it in twenty twelve, like literally like the brain lights up in so many ways because you're like D -d 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 -d. it's like suddenly all these things start to make sense. Mm -hmm. Like, oh what if that's viral? What if that's viral? Is this viral? Is this viral? If it's viral, oh my gosh, it makes so much sense. So you start to it just completely shifts everything. So I hear you with that. That's powerful. Um I I know you also apply as much of the protocols in your own life and you know you walk that talk as well. How does it fly with your patients when people come in? Um, I'm sure you have patients from your old world who are just like, I just want a doctor, give me some pills. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. I'm sure you have patients who come to you from the medical medium community as well who want your support. How do you do you find that those are two distinct worlds? Are you able to bridge? Are you able to bridge your old clients patients over a little bit? Or is that just so different? Some some have and some won't some will not and that's okay, too. And, and I think Anthony, you know, you if you guys are practitioners out there, you'd say, well, what would Anthony do in this situation? Right? Yeah. Um, Anthony is always learning too. He spirit is telling him all this new stuff and he has to relearn the information. He'll forget um, stuff that he put in the book because he's, you know, you're staying up all night. You're staying up all night and uh, you're writing the books and you're just exhausted. He, every time he finishes the book, he's like, I just kill myself over this book. So all the stuff he put in it, he doesn't remember, you know, offhand like that. He has to review it and stuff. Like that. So just yeah. a reminder for you practitioners out there, you don't have to know it 100%. You can go back and read and just like Anthony does. We, we both do it, right? We always go back. Oh, there's something new. There's a little subtlety here that, you know, and it's all. The, the books are packed with information and you could go over two, you know, nine times and find new stuff. Um, but going back to my old patients, some of them won't do it at all. They will not, you know, ah, celery juice, I tried that. It didn't work. They tried for a day. They didn't like it. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. But again, that's why I do, I do, because I have to walk the talk to show them like, you know, I'm doing it. So I'm going to ask you to do it too. You're not there alone, right? And then some people go have just really run with it. They've done really well with it. And it's just, this is hard, you know, because you've, you've got this brainwashing from misinformation, other stuff from other you know, doctors and, and, and influencers and, and the naturopaths in the area, right? I mean, I, I hate to say this, but I'm kind of a bargain. You know, I take insurance and I'm going to give you the cutting edge information um, and things like, okay, for instance, right? There's this new study that came out that says intermittent fasting is detrimental for cardiovascular endpoints, right? They took 200,000, I think it was 20,000 patients. And it's not a real study in that it's around my control, but it's pointing to the information that Anthony is saying is like, hey guys, intermittent fasting is not the best thing in the world. But if you want to do this, we could probably take things that this is what Anthony said. And then, oh, here's the science that backs it up. Or this is what the trend is. You're talking about fish oil. You're talking about, um, talking about, you know, high protein, high fat diets, which is keto or something like this. He saw said that already. And he's been, if you, you know, look at the science, he's been right about it, right? Mm -hmm. The science takes time to develop to kind of back his case up. But these are the things that you'll, you'll find out as a, as we go along and we use information, right? Yeah. No, it, it all makes so much sense. Basically, the truth is science has never disproven medical medium information. It has only in time proven medical medium information so 
That said, just because it hasn't been proven yet doesn't mean it won't be in the future. And that already you have shared so many articles with me about how in medical journals they're writing about Epstein-Barr and MS or Epstein-Barr with neurological disease. You know, these articles have come out in the last two, three years and medical medium has been around in, in book form since 2015. So clearly, you know, there's an influence there, I believe. And the fact that they're writing about it and putting it into the journals is proving because it's already pre-published information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you approach clients who are combative with you or do you not get the patients who are combative or do you not oh, really? Oh, gosh. So, oh, yes. Um, my own family members are combative. What do you need to do with that, right? With your own family members, you just love them. You just love them. You're like, you know what? You do your thing. I'll do my thing. And, you know, we'll go from there. But I take it from that standpoint. It's like if my own family member is giving me trouble about it, how can a patient not? How is no one related to me do that, right? So you say, okay, look, um, yeah, it can be frustrating, and you have to kind of man self manage your own adrenals, so to speak. So in that way, you kind of you know learn. Um, but basically, you um, you you reiterate the information for them in a different way, people that they can hear, and but you allow them the, the the freedom to do whatever they want to do. Everybody has free will. Anthony has said like. If you're like a parent and you're like, you got to do this, right? What do you think is going to happen? Your kid's going to go, screw you, mom, dad, you know? You just listen to them. You, you meet them where they're at. That's what Anthony does. Yeah. So, you know, I hope that you're all appreciating this very nuanced and detailed discussion about our the worlds that we live in, the worlds that we occupy, Dr. Fan occupies as a medical professional, as a doctor, as a person who is literally bridging these worlds every day, right? You're bridging these worlds every day with your clients and with your partners, uh, your work partner, your, your, you know, domestic partner, your family. Um, it's so when you work with um, him, you will get all of that compassion, all of that understanding, which I believe really more doctors need to have because it, it's just time. There's too many sick people in the world. Do you, have you ever, did you ever subscribe to the theory that, you know, your body is attacking itself or, you know, saying to someone it's all in your head because the results are, um, you know, normal or telling a woman that it was her hormones? I mean, I kind of, I'm kind of like picking on you a little bit, but like, did you ever go there or was your, what, what was your, how did you approach that conversation? Knowing what I know now, I would say I probably did. I mean, I, I, I have a bad memory. Ask ask my wife. She's like, he forgets everything. You're like, you know, this conversation we had and you said this. And she's like, how, like, how does she remember that? I'm pretty sure I did. Okay. And I will say, yes, it is your hormones now. Now I say it's your hormones, but it's your adrenal and cortisol hormones, right? Because right. Anthony says, you know, the, the key, and you told me this, right? The key to, to if you're going to fix one thing, it's going to be the adrenals. You got to work the adrenals to be really like strong and stable. So when people come to see me and say, look, it's my hormones. I'm like, you're not wrong, but it's not the sex hormones, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So true. It's not the sex hormones. Um, people forget that adrenaline is a hormone, actually. There you go. Yeah. They don't. It, and it, it explains a lot. And I wish I had time. I would be doing like these videos on YouTube about like how... how People ask, ask, how come this way works? How come this carnivore work for me? Or how come keto work for me? How come intermittent fasting work for me? Because it has to do with adrenals. When you're not eating, you're putting adrenaline out there. You're putting your stress on your body and your body's release adrenaline. And you're like, I feel great. Wow. Or you go vegan, like totally raw vegan, right? From being a, you know, omnivore or whatever. And then your adrenals are kicking in because you're not eating enough. Yeah. And then you feel great. You're like, oh, I'm feeling awesome. And then six months later, you're losing all this hair. You're like, oh, veganism is the wrong way to do it. And then you you go back to what you know, eggs and dairy again. So, or, or you're eating carnivore and you're putting a lot of protein or meat in your system and your body's just pushing down adrenaline to break it up and keep your blood thin so you don't suffocate from it. You're feeling really good. It has to do with adrenaline. Yeah. I mean, didn't Anthony call bone broth uh, adrenaline soup? Yeah. You, you're talking to me that I'm, I'm Vietnamese, man. Pho is, is bone broth. I mean, yeah. you know, like I had to cut that off. I'm like, how am I going to do this? This is nuts. Um, but when yeah. you're in it, you're in it for somebody else. 
you you're willing to make these sacrifices. If you're in your first self, you're willing to make sacrifices, of course, right? But yeah. sometimes that's a, that's to me that's a way to do it. Like you look at you're not doing it for yourself. I mean, because uh, you know you can eat just crap and enjoy yourself and die at 33, but you're doing it for somebody else. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean exactly. When I mean when you think of um, making changes in a family and you're trying to support somebody, then you know you can you can move with that. But I understand the whole cultural thing because I gave up rice and I gave up um, flatbread chapati. Yeah, <laughs> it has gluten in it, yeah. and my my family just. My mom's like, what do you mean? You're never going to eat my biryani again? Or like, you're not <laughs> going to have, you know, roti again? And I'm like, um, for now, like, I didn't know what to say, right? We're just like, you know, and that, you, like, her biryani is like one of my favorite things in the world. So I get it when we're giving up these things. And, you know, in our culture, um, as with every culture, but like chicken soup, like bone broth, chicken, bo chicken broth was given to me so many times, you know, I was struggling with asthma symptoms and allergies, right? Laying in bed, I can't breathe. And they're feeding me, they're feeding me bone broth. And I had so much of that in my life, just because that's what everybody thought was, you know, I mean, of course, it has spices and stuff in it to make it like Pakistani, but right. that they fed me because I think that like every culture has a version of like a bone broth that is their unique, like you have, pho, we have what we call yakni. So, um, you know, yeah, it's battling all these cultural pieces and understanding, you know, where we're going. Somebody uh, kind of told me they were unfollowing me on Instagram because I mentioned that you didn't have to soak your lentils before making a dosa. And she got mm -hmm. into this like eight, nine, ten <laughs> argument deep with me. I'm like, mm -hmm. I really don't care if you soak it or don't. I don't. People ask me and she's like, this is ridiculous. You'll get you'll get sick from making dosa like that. And I'm like, whoa, like, you know, what we hold on to sometimes people just kind of, and it's oh, yeah. simple soaking or not soaking your lentils. I mean, okay. Um, so, you know, let's go to some questions that have come through. And right. one of the questions that we got was, um, was about thyroid medication and I know you have a lot of experience with this so someone said if I came to you um, as a thyroid patient I'm on medication um, I'm weaning off of it on my own what would you recommend for me to include in supplementation that could help me wean off of it and what would you just recommend in that general situation support the adrenals back to the adrenals remember the adrenals help support your thyroid. And so when you're coming off of it, and this is the difference between different thyroid medicines, right? It's like the T3 stuff pushes your adrenals, so you feel better. But if you have bad adrenals, you're gonna, you're gonna crash uh, eventually. So support your adrenals as you're weaning off. You may not go as fast as maybe the thyroid healing book says. It depends on you. You've been on it for 20 years, 30 years, you still got a bunch of thyroid medication in your liver. And the release of it is gonna be different for each person. So, um, uh, yeah, work with your doctor, go slow, change it around, uh, support those adrenals first though. Right. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's a very good, very good answer. Um, because when you start to wean off of thyroid medication, the first thing that happens is that your body starts to also dump out old thyroid medication from your liver. So when that's happening, a bit more triggered, so to speak, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you eating every 90 minutes to two hours, maybe even 60? Everybody's different. You know, some people have to go every hour, some people every 45 minutes, depending on how bad you are. Um, and of course, you know, use the adrenal supplements. And, and, and of course, those supplements, some of them people are sensitive to licorice, let's say. They have to use Siberian ginseng instead. They have to use, you know, a lot of ashwagandha. Everybody's a little different. There's, there's, there's nightshade fear and all that stuff. You know, it's not, it's not that. You might be just sensitive, and eventually, over time, you can use those things. So we have Julie Scheibel in the comments here, um, coming in from YouTube, and she says, "My thyroid is getting larger, and I cannot sleep. My adrenals are shot. 
I have a dry mouth syndrome and I'm not producing enough saliva and I'm feeling pretty hopeless. What would you share with um, her to help her give her more hope? One of the things, here's the thing, you, Julie, you can be perfect on the supplements on, you know, in the book, like exactly, you can even be on higher doses of, of you know, some people need to be higher doses because when Anthony writes dosages, he's going to write like a general kind of easy one. He is not going to give you the exact dose for you. You have to figure that out. Um, but if you can do, you're doing this, you're doing the protocol exactly. You're getting off all the no foods. Yeah. But if your adrenals are off, it can be the difference between seeing results or not. Okay. What affects your adrenals? Of course, eating regularly, keeping your blood sugar stable. What is your stress level going into this, right? Some of these things are hard to control. You can't control your kids in a nutcase. You can't control if your spouse is giving you trouble or your job is doing these things. Those are difficult to control. The only thing that you control is how you react as best as you can using the meditations, for instance, that are free by adrenally snacking and by uh, trying to reduce whatever stress may be removed from whomever or whatever is giving you that stress, if you can do it. Some people can't get away from that because of the life circumstances. So just know that you have to keep on going. Remember when you're going through hell, you got to keep on going, right? And you need maybe consider working with somebody or anybody, a friend or a practitioner. A practitioner is a little better. Your friend's a little biased, but they can see things that you cannot see. And I think Muniza taught me this. You can't look up your own butthole. So it's hard to see things uh, that you're not, you, you don't see what you don't see. Basically, you can't recognize that. So you might need some help. Yeah, I mean, that's solid advice. And um, Julie, you know, I'm sorry that you're feeling hopeless, but protect starting with your adrenals. Start taking care of them, you know, eat the adrenal snacks every 90 minutes. Like Dr. Fan said, some people need them every 30 minutes. I've even had clients doing them every 15 minutes. Oh, wow. But that's what they needed to stabilize. It took a week or two of doing them every 15 minutes for them to be able to not jitter every, thir you know, jitter throughout the day because you had to build up that glucose reserve inside. So start doing that, you know. I mean, it, it wasn't like she was eating a lot every 15 minutes. It was literally like two big sips. Uh, she would blend it. Um, the adrenal sacs would be blended and she would drink two big sips every 15 minutes. And if you can't do that, maybe it's just honey that you need to do, like a little you know, spoon of honey, if that's the easiest or the cheapest thing you can do. Because again, not all of us are billionaires, you know, like me, I'm a billionaire. No, I'm joking. No, I'm not, I'm not. Um, but it's, uh, I'm a cheap, I'm a, I'm a cheapskate. Uh, but, but maybe it's just honey. It's easy to do because you can't, you're laying in mattress island. You can't get out of bed and do this stuff. You just got to grab that honey and go like that. Yeah, so I, I I really thank you, Julie, for your question. I hope some of these tips can help you. So our next question is from someone on Facebook, and Tammy Chapa asks, I know that lab tests for Epstein-Barr can be elusive, but if one were to get a test, what kind would be the best to get? First off, you don't need to have it. If you've got all the symptoms, you don't need the test. I use the test for people who don't understand Anthony's information or are not open into it yet. And they say, and I said, okay, I, I present with, hey, I think your autoimmune disease is a viral issue that your body ha is having a, um, a uh, basically reaction to the, to the virus, basically, right? Um, and so I show them, hey, look, see, you've got Epstein Barr in this test. I do the Epstein Barr early antigen and also the Epstein Barr antibody panel. You can get that in Quest or LabCorp, but you don't need to do that. You, you, if you know the symptoms already, it doesn't change. You'll go, the markers will show that you've been exposed to Epstein bar, I'm sorry, virus and these I, immune IgG basically, and it says you've been exposed in the past, right? Um, it doesn't change what you do. You, you still do the protocols. But if for those who people are in on the edge who like, don't, doesn't really believe in the Epstein bar theory and stuff like this, I should kind of when you have something on paper, it kind of helps people understand that more and kind of get on uh, on board with the protocols. Yeah. For sure. That's a good response. And would you say that maybe sometimes it's helpful to do a test for a family member? Because if they're not convinced and they're giving you a hard time. Yeah, I think so. Um, just remember, just remember taking account, is this family member very fragile in health? Because you're taking more blood out of them. You're taking away their white blood cells. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So our next question is from... Um, Sally Lucas, and she's asking Dr. Fan, 
How long do you think it would take for an MTHFR gene mutation to no longer show up on a blood test? I have been strictly following MM protocol since 2015, using supplements, doing lots of cleanses, brain shots, shock therapies to heal my fibromyalgia, and all kinds of gut issues, migraines, and so much more. Thank you for doing this live. How long is difficult? Um, I, I don't think you can ever put a time frame on things, right? It depends on what's going on. The virus will always be there. Remember, the Epstein bar causes the MTH or gene mutation test to be positive. And so um, it can be years. Uh, I don't know how many years your your clients have done that, but I haven't had one because I don't really want to test it. It's a it's like a thousand bucks. Insurance doesn't cover it because it's considered experimental. Uh, and even then, if you got a positive test, what is the geneticist, the PhD doctor going to tell you? Take some methylfolate. That's it. That's really that's basically it. Um, so I, I say, regardless of how long it shows, uh, if it's still showing positive, if you've done it a few times, then we still got more work to do for the liver and to push the, the viral uh, load down. Well, in terms of what it's showing you, right? Anthony did say that um, when they test you for Lyme disease and they look for spirochetes in the blood, it's yeah. a spirochete in the blood, which is basically the spirochete doesn't come from a tick. It comes from Epstein-Barr. It's one of the neurotoxic wastes that comes yeah. comes from epstein -Barr. That's what they find in the blood. And that's what triggers the MTHFR gene mutation test positive. So Sally, yeah. think about, you know, if your symptoms are better and you're feeling better, why do you really want to know that the test is now negative? I have clients who've done it because they, you know, they're very much into science and testing and they want that. Yeah. They need that kind of validation. That kind of validation. But if you don't need it, then I wouldn't personally do it. Just your, you feeling better is good enough, right? Save your money and save your blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I say. Yeah, exactly. All right, question is from uh, Hilda. Hilda says, um, how does one get off ADHD medication after being on it for 30 years um, with minimal withdrawal side effects? And her related question is, have you ever helped somebody come off of Amibog for migraines? She said, I've tried, but after two months, they just creep back. So I don't have a lot of patients on that medication. Um, so I can't say I, I have had done that. But um, I think that there are plenty of people who have gotten off migraine medications in general using the protocols, right? Um, to get off the ADD medication is to basically pull the metals out, help your adrenals. Always, I mean, every single protocol in there is to help the adrenals. You got to stabilize the adrenals. And then... Um, it's a matter of getting the toxins out of the system, which again, may take years. I don't know how long you've been in medication or not, right? Yeah, I don't know what yeah. she does. Let me, let me step away to fix this IV real quick. I'm gonna, I Go just ahead. Some blood on myself. Hang on. Yeah, no worries. So okay, while we're waiting for Dr. Fan, um, let me talk about some questions that you all put in. Um, so we'll come back to Hilda's question in a minute. And then, um, so Diana Christina asks about how to fix low iron levels and what causes them. So according to medical medium, uh, if you're not bleeding out anywhere, right? If you're bleeding out, like you have a hemorrhage in the brain, or if you have some sort of bleeding, extra bleeding coming vaginally, or you have some hidden kind of bleeding happening in the body, that can push down your iron levels. But barring that, it's viral. So one of the hallmarks of, you know, iron levels being uh, too low or too high even in hemochromatosis is when there's too much mercury in the bloodstream and you have a higher viral load, which is, which is pushing down your iron levels because Epstein-Barr in particular will eat your iron in your blood, right? It will eat that and bring it down. So you said, how do you fix that? You fix that by bringing in, first of all, addressing the viral load, number one. Do the core seven, like I talk about, B12, zinc, 
microsy, lysine, cat's claw, lemon balm, licorice root, if you don't have high blood pressure for licorice root. And then the next most important thing is to start looking at bringing in things like spirulina, super high in iron, barley grass juice powder, really high in iron. Gaia Plant Force Liquid Iron Supplement will also help because it has a lot of natural herbs to help boost iron levels. Um, you know, beyond that, you can do nettle leaf, also builds iron, red raspberry leaf, tea really builds iron in the body. So there's a lot of tools that you can use to build your iron. Um, I'm, uh, I was just answering a question while you were away. Coming back to the question on, you said Amavog and ADHD medications. Have you helped people come off of ADHD medication? I haven't directly done that. I think people have stopped on their own, basically doing some of the protocols. Yeah, I, I, I honestly, I think you probably have more experience in that than I do as far as like numbers of people who have done it. Um, you've seen that ten, tens of thousands of patients at this point. Off, sometimes cases that I'm surprised that I've never seen, you, you've seen. <laughs> it's just kind of funny when we talk about things. Um, I guess... Sometimes if a doctor is telling you it cannot be cured or there's nothing you can do for it, then they're not even trying to find a doctor to help with that. Right. Um, but, you know, I guess I do see a lot of cases because people are coming at me with seemingly what is impossible to do and asking, can we do this or can we try this? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I have helped. I have. I have overseeing somebody who was coming off of ADHD medication. Um, she was doing it with her doctor, um, but she wanted my help. So it depends on also the medication, right? Yeah. Some medication for ADHD is, um, has got a lot of, well, all of them have toxic heavy metals in them. Mm -hmm. All of them have, um, pharmacy, you know, petroleum chemicals in them and other nasties. I mean, they have all kinds of nasty preservatives and, you know, nasty ingredients could be artificial colors, could be, could be anything. It could be gluten. It could be dairy. All those things are still in there. You know, are you using the one thing you had to ask yourself, are you using the pharmaceutical exposure shot? Because that would be helpful in pulling those things out of your system. Right. So important. Um, so, you know, it depends on the medication. It depends on how you do as you come off of it. But I look, my approach is always this. If your medication is really helping you and stabilizing you, I think it's important to heal the underlying condition, i.e. your ADHD or your migraines to help you come off of it. Because if you start to come off of it and you start to have symptoms, that means that when you take the mask off, I think the medication is like a mask. When you take the mask off, underneath that, there's still swampy water, right? There's still mud. It's still not clean and clear. So that's one thing. But also, Dr. Fan, as you know, Medications all have side effects. We do. Uh, so here's the thing. Work with your doctor. There's a time and a place for medication. There's times when Anthony has told us, take the medication because your adrenals are going nuts and you need to calm things down. And then you get off slowly off of it or whatever it is. There's a time and a place, right? Um, there's a time and a place for antibiotics if you've got a ruptured appendix or something like this. There's, But you, you, you need to have that help sometimes with a professional to help you get you through that, especially after if you need to taper off medication. Even if it's a nurse practitioner or, you know, a physician assistant, sometimes they're going to be more compassionate and hearing of you than a regular, your regular MD. You think that the doctor with a white coat has a better understanding, but you guys as practitioners who don't have an MD, who are maybe not even certified in anything, but you can walk people through these protocols, you know, you're, you're, you have a gift there. You want to work with a, a person who will work with you to get there. I mean, there's so many classes of different kinds of ADHD medication. Isn't Adderall one of them? 
Adderall's, yeah, very, very, there's a shortage too, yes. Right. I mean, I don't know. You're probably not on that, but you have, you know, you have different classes of medication. I think there's four main types. There's stimulating, non-stimulating, um, short-acting, long-acting. You have, you know, there's a huge class of drugs that are just amphetamines. Now, Dr. Fan, what can you tell us about amphetamines? If someone's on an amphetamine drug for years, what would that create in them? I mean, addiction could be. Yeah, a, a dependence. I mean, I, I, you know, you, you might think the addiction is like, oh, it's a bad thing. You know, no, you're talking about dependence. Your body's de you know, physically dependent on it and you stop it too fast or abruptly, you're going to screw yourself, right? Um, one of the common things, I and mean, this is a little out, but benzodiazepines, Valium that you know your grandma used to take all the time. These are benzodiazepines and they're addictive. You stop them abruptly, you can do yourself a lot of damage. So you have to go really slow uh, in tapering off. And there are protocols for that that outside of the medical meeting protocol, but they, they, where they were really just giving small, just taking off small small amounts week by week. I had a guy who's on uh, benzo for like a month, and he's had to take take himself off for three or four months to get off of it. You know, so and that's not, it's not easy. It's a rump, it's a bumpy road getting off. So give yourself time if you have to, right? Yeah. Yeah, you just have to go really slowly. I mean, I think people want to rush, but shave off a little bit at a time yeah. for many years and go very very slow. So, um, on the topic of ADHD, someone's asking what are great supplements for children for ADHD. Well, Anthony doesn't differentiate between supplements for children versus supplements for adults um we're all human so supplements work the same in adults and children and he outlines actually a really good adhd protocol in the brain saver book if you have not checked it yet um do look at it and it includes you know because the supplement protocols are built off of what is the root cause of the issue and then how do we address it so you know you're looking at Obviously, doing uh, looking at heavy metals being in the brain, fresh celery juice plays into it. Heavy metal detox smoothie is important, and then there's shots. Like people who have ADHD, their adrenals are running all the time. You know, this is hyperactivity disorder, right? So they're hyper. Um, so adrenal fight or flight stabilizer shot is really powerful, and children can have that. And um, you wouldn't be able to do the dosages that are in the um, Brain Saver book because those are adult dosages, um, but you can do a ch child's dose, you know, you can work it out or work with a practitioner, but like lemon balm is soothing and calming, GABA is calming, uh, B-complex, 5-MTHF, um, melatonin, these are all like soothing to the nervous system and the brain, so you start with tools like that and kids can have all those things, um, just with the herbs, the golden seal, you know, the licorice root, you just have to do smaller amounts and work with that. But that's a great protocol. Many of my clients have used it. I've, I always tweak protocols based on what somebody individually needs, but this is a great way to go. So I hope that helps. Um, okay. Um, next question we have is from someone saying, Lauren is asking, Natural supplements are not helping my severe nerve spasms in my brain stem. They cause a choking-like situation and sometimes a TIA, so she's having seizures, right? What medications or other treatments would you recommend in this case? So I'd recommend you talk to your neurologist and they can give you some, some, some insight about that, right? Uh, you said the supplements. I mean, are we doing California poppy shock? Are we doing magnesium, both neuromag and magnesium glycinate? Are we doing lemon balm, of course? Are we doing uh, the heavy metal detox smoothie? Are you eating regularly to get your blood sugar stabilized so your body doesn't go into a stressed state and throw you into more of those, those issues? Um, Medication-wise, again, there's all sorts of uh, seizure medications you can take to stabilize you a little bit. Um, one of the more popular ones are Keppra, which is um, something you'd have to have a doctor work with you to, to, to prescribe. And monitor your levels on right um so those are starters but again i would say work with your work with the doctor to get to that point because if the seizures are causing problems and you can't work or you can't even drive you need something to kind of stabilize that yeah a hundred percent i 
I agree. You absolutely need to stabilize it. That's really important. Um, yeah, so we have a question here from Christine. Um, let me pull it up onto the page. And she says, please help me help my son's ears. He has autism. He gets thick wax, gets inflamed, um, and has white film, takes oregano oil on medication for fungus, and goes away on it for a week but comes right back. Yeah. That's a strep problem, right? And a liver problem. So uh, we work at detoxing the liver. Hopefully he's on the HMDS, the heavy metal detox smoothie. He's eating cleaner. I don't know what his diet's like, but if you're putting foods in that will make the liver work harder and make feed the strep, you're going to get this wax, right? Um, you also need to, the fungus, when there's a fungus, uh, typically there's an imbalance in the flora. There's more strep going on. And if it's candida, which you hear is a boogeyman, it's not the boogeyman, it's it's actually trying to be your friend and trying to stabilize things and take up resources of strep. But it's a sign that it's off and you need to work on the immune system and stuff. So is he doing cellar juice or a little bit even? I know it's hard to get these kids to, to take it, but if you look up me at Medical Medium Mommy on Instagram, she's got her journey of how she's you know helped basically uh, you know heal his autism uh, using, and she would put these cellar juice and heavy medicine smoothies in these big syringes and just push in his mouth and make him do it, right? So it, it's hard. I don't know how old your child is, but you know you know your child better than I do. And you would basically kind of, once the child gets used to this regimen, then they continue to, to want to have it. it. So it's kind of a matter of getting them used to it. They may have sensory issues uh, where it's like too cold or too whatever it is. You've got to figure out how the smoothie, what kind of texture and consistency he, he or she likes about it, right? Um, but you can continue to use the uh, the the, gar the garlic and mullein you know drops if you need to, uh, but the wax will build up because strep is there. So eggs, dairy, gluten, canola, soy, all these things feeding strep, and of course feeding Epsom bar too. Um, taking those out is very important. It's hard with kids who are autistic, right? Because they're also picky eaters. Yeah. And they have textural issues sometimes, so you have to go slow with those types of kids and. You have to offer foods in a loving way, but really mildly add things in a little bit at a time. Kind of being like a sneaky mom to do it. You know, if yeah. I were to tell you, you know, to address that situation, it's 100% a strep situation happening in the ears. And so one of the things I would recommend is um, doing the mold exposure shot, for example, or bringing in the pathogen exposure shot to kill off more of this bug or like the turmeric, garlic, ginger, orange juice shot, which mm -hmm. is for killing off strep as well. So there's many options that you have to be able to use to get results with this. And then um, I don't know if you've heard of or whether you'd be able to with your child, um, the garlic mullein eardrops, you can drop those into the ear to knock out strep. You can um, also take, oh, there, look, there you go. Yeah. Gar mullen eardrops are so helpful for knocking out strep and, um, being able to use a golden seal, for example, um, internally lemon balm, thyme tea. These are all things that you can give a child, um, to help knock back this issue. So I hope Christine, um, you know, that answers some of your questions and, that you have some ideas on how to move forward with that. All right, our next question is from um, Gautilicious. She says, my doctor wants me to do a colonoscopy and I don't want to drink the solution or a laxative. What is an alternative to this? Is there anything? Yes, so you have to do it under the radar, so to speak. Um, you, you could go to a colonic hydrotherapist and get a colonic, but you typically, in my state, you need a prescription for that from a doctor. So and unless your place is like, no, we can do it without a doctor's prescription. You can get a colonic and it'll clean you out, basically, get all the poop out. Um, there are other formulations for the PrEP, like magnesium um, uh, citrate, which is those big bottles that are, and you can do that. It's a little easier than go lightly, which is what they typically give you. So you're, you're spending a whole entire day drinking that every 10 minutes or something and just pooping on the toilet all day. It's very adrenally stressful because you're not eating and you're just drinking and you're pooping all day. So then the next day after that, you're starving and then they stick a scope up your butt, you know, and that's that's all a lot of fun if, if you're into that. But um, 
it's it the other option is the magnesium uh, citrate option or the colonic um i don't know i mean i, I don't know how much celery juice you'd have to do to clean yourself out i don't think it might not you know do that uh so uh, that's what I would recommend as an alternative if you can if you can get a funnel colonic or a, ask your doctor about that magnesium uh, citrate option. Yeah, um, I agree. There's so many ways to do this, but Dr. Fenn just suggested a couple. You know, if you can't get your insurance to pay for a colonic, you could pay for it yourself and do it that way. I'm sure so some doctors write suppositories as well, just to kind of clean up the vault. Because sometimes when they go in there, they still see a lot of stool in there, and they say it's an inadequate prep, and they really didn't, you know, it's hard to, to see anything. And you know, you took all this trouble to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're enjoying this uh, conversation with Dr. Pan, uh, consider joining us on our Ask the Doctor panel. Right there is a QR code. You can just click it and take a photo or snap on it, and it will take you to the link. Um, you're going to have conversations like this with Dr. Fan, Dr. Monica Cabelli, Ma Paula Bennett, and also Dr. Joy Clark. And you have on the panel a doctor of internal medicine, OBGYN, or, um, a psychiatrist, and a urologist. And they're all heavily steeped into medical medium. And it'll be just a fantastic place to get answers both from the medical side and the medical medium side. So I think you, you cannot miss this event. If you really are enjoying this and want more of it, consider joining us for this. It's um, four calls over um, and, uh, you know, over the year, over eight hours of content and asking questions. So I hope you'll consider joining us. All right. So our next question is, I'm going to leave that up there for you guys. Our next question is uh, from uh, someone, someone's asking about what is heart failure and I have a problem in my right bundle branch block and I'm having mild heart failure. What causes it? What can I do? Right. So um, <laughs> there, there are different reasons for that. One, one could be viral, obviously, right? Uh, I've seen viral plays a big role in, in, in a lot of these heart issues that we didn't even think, doctors don't even think about. Cardiologists don't. They just think it's, you know, it's a mechanical thing, longstanding high blood pressure, something like this, uh, coronary artery disease, things like this. From the medical meaning standpoint, is hey, have you have you cut back on a high protein, high fat diet? Have you added ubiqu uh, CoQ10? Have you done antiviral protocols? Are you doing celery juice to you know to help all these flush out toxins and such like this? Um, uh, there is a, you know in cleanse heal. I think he does. He have a section on heart disease. I'm sure, but it's, uh, it's, um, heart conditions are covered a little bit in the brain book. In the brain book, yeah. So there, there are neurological reasons for things like atrial fibrillation uh, on top of just heart. Um, but the valves are off and, you know, you got to cleanse the toxins out of your system. So get off the no troublemaker foods, bring in the, the staples of celery juice, do some cleanses, bring in supplements that are good, including CoQ10 and spirulina and the heavy metal detox and all those different things. Those are, That's a start. Um, magnesium is very important. Um, for, for, you know, regulation of, it helps with the heart and in terms of electrical signal, you know, conductance, right? Um, I don't know if you've had a long-standing high blood pressure, which indicates liver issues for years now, um, or is it because you had a heart attack? I'm not sure, you know, specifics, right? But th those are some pl uh, places to start. Yeah. And just following on from that, some things to really consider for heart failure CoQ10, really critical. Uh, Hawthorne berry is very protective of the heart. Um, so make sure you get on that. Oregon grapefruit is really helpful for that too. Um, you know, all the supplements help, but these are just specifics. And then reishi mushroom is very heart focused, heart specific. Olive leaf is helpful for circulation, blood pressure. Also, all things related to the heart. So I would recommend that, even though it's not a direct supplement for the heart, but it's for the circulatory system. Um, you know, and Oregon grapefruit I recommend because most heart, anything viral that attacks the heart is often HHV6 um, from what we know from medical medium information. So Oregon grapefruit attacks HHV6. So make sure it's in your protocol. So I hope 
that that helps. Um, so I'm sorry you're going through that. It's a very tough thing to go through, especially when it is your heart. Um, you know, that's, that's hard. All right, our next question is from uh, Jeanette, who asks about her kidneys. Let me find her question. Um, so she actually has two questions. One was about her kidneys. So I'm going to read that one out and then I'll post her other question. So I have had a blocked ureter as a child and have always had problems with kidneys and UTIs. You know, Jeanette, if you join the Ask the Doctor panel, this would be a really good question for Dr. Kabeli, who is a urologist. But yes. I'm sure Dr. Fan will do his best to answer here as well. What is the best way for me to take care of my kidneys as I'm getting older? The best ways are celery juice, getting off uh, animal protein as much as you can so that you don't put an extra burden on your kidneys to process that. You know, you'll, you, there's a number called the creatinine, and they use that number in the equation for the glomerular filtration rate. So as we age, supposedly the, your, your kidney function declines because you're losing units of kidneys called nephrons. So they say, hey, get off of animal protein so you don't have to burden your, your kidneys as hard, right? H adequate hydration, of course, but celery juice is very good for that. Um, what are the things, uh, anti, you know, a good antiviral protocol because, you know, HSV6 could come out anytime and cause issues, right? Um, Epstein bar can cause cysts in, in the kidneys and whatnot. So again, a good antiviral protocol on top of, of uh, a low, uh, a low animal protein diet, if, if no animal protein diet, if you want to that, go that route. Yeah. Um, animal protein is a hard no on kidney issues. Have you listened to the kidney radio show? I think it's on Apple Podcasts, so go find it. Go listen to it. It'll give you a lot of good insight. Um, asparagus is, a, is an amazing food for kidneys. Make sure you have it in your diet every day. Grapes are great for kidneys, so make sure you have those in your diet every day. But I think the kidneys, you know, unless they're directly attacked by a virus, and again, the virus that attacks kidneys per medical medium is... HHV6. So the Oregon grapefruit matters. And then, um, you know, the full antiviral protocol matters. So make sure that you're checking those out and bringing those elements into your protocols. And this, I thought, next question is a really good one for you. Um, can you talk about blood draws? How to navigate labs, doctors, especially for cancer patients? Right. So it's difficult because your doctor will be asking for more blood. When's the last time a doctor actually took a needle and stuck it in you and you tourniquet and took the blood out of your cell? They really typically don't. I do that because it's cathartic for me. I, I It's cheaper than therapy. So I stick people with needles because I like doing it. Um, but I try to take as little as possible. Um, some I know Anthony says you can only ask for so much. Here's what my experience is. Sometimes I send it off and the lab's like insufficient amount of blood. I'm like, what? You... So, so what happened is probably the guy who is the tech who put into the, you know, the blood into the load into the machine, they used too much the first time around. They didn't get it, leave enough for the next set of round of tests. But you, you, what you want to do is you want to um, ask your doctor if you would write on the blood, uh, the blood test form, like you print it out, or even type it in there, um, please draw from pediatric tubes. If they won't do that, then please draw a quarter tube only, right? And, and Anthony said, if the if the phlebotomist is like, no, we need more, so I'll come back. I'll come back. Or I'll do that later, right? Because uh, if there are five or six specialists or three different specialties in that oncology, you know, field that they're going to, they're going to ask for their own separate tests. And each time you're getting blood drawn and it's overlapping. So that's pulling the whole white blood cells out of your system. Remember, your white blood cells are your soldiers to fight off infections. And you're taking those away, right? Because they're, they're also going to fight not only infections, but also you know, abnormal cells or whatever it is. So if you can ask them to do less somehow, and if the dog's like, that's a bunch of hooey, all you need is drink some water, eat a chocolate chip cookie, you'll be, your blood will be back in two days. That's not true. But if your doctor is, is giving you a hard time about it, you, you, when you go to the lab, whether it's the nurse or phlebotomist, you say, hey, look, my doctor told me <laughs> that I should take less vials. And if I need, I'll come back. But why? Because if I faint, you're going to have to pick me up. And I don't want to faint in front of you and pee on pee all over the floor. And they're like, oh yeah, okay, yeah. Well, we'll just we'll take a little less. We'll come back if you have to, you know. But again, it's it's the compassion of the of, of the phlebotomist. Like, okay, I'll I'll do that, right? But um, if they're lucky, you can get these little pediatric tubes that are very small and and, and draw that from that. 
But the phlebotomist is just following the manual that says, this is the minimal amount I have to get. Uh, in reality, sometimes you don't need that much. Right. Yeah, it's interesting what, what gets called out, right? Very interesting. Yeah. But of course, do the blood draw protocols, you know, in the brain book, make sure that you, if you have to do it, the before and the after, the one week before, the one week after, make sure that you're doing those. That makes a huge difference. All right, another question is from Busy Lizzie, and she says, I'm struggling to get my shingles into remission after I caught the plague in September and have several bad flus since then. So she's got a weakened immune system since the plague. And whilst she's employing a lot of medical medium tools, is there an antiviral medication that she can use to help things along? I'm really suffering. It's causing burning, hot redness along the trigeminal nerves of my face. Please help. Okay, so the IV, the medications that they have typically are antivirals like Valtrex or Valacyclovir, Acyclovir. My experience has been if over time, your body, uh, people will develop a resistance to it. The, the viruses are smart too, and they can circumvent the, 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 that medication. So uh, I had a patient who I had to bring to the hospital to get IV treatments of antivirals, and she eventually succumbed to her illnesses, multiple issues going on. Um, I guess if, if it's really bad and it's all over the place and it's going to affect the other nerves and you know, there's shingles you can get in the eye basically and you can go blind. Yeah, throw the antivirals, at, throw the steroids at it, whatever to save the vision. But uh, you have to always weigh the, 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 the benefits versus the risks. And we talk about this all the time. What are the benefits of taking a medication to ease the pain because the nerves are so bad? So for instance, they would probably give you Neurontin or they call Gabapentin. And um, it can make you real drowsy, it can make you constipated. But if it helps you function and you can work and earn a living because you didn't have it, then maybe you should, should consider doing that. But at the same time, hitting the protocol is hard. You're using California poppy on a shock basis or you're using propolis. You're using all these different things to fight it down until finally you can, you know, you can get a hold of it and then eventually come off these medications because the medications themselves may be feeding a certain amount of the viruses, like with the heavy metals, with the corn in it, with all these different fillers and stuff like this. So it's a call you have to make as far as I'm willing to get temporary relief so uh, so that you know that I can stop it later on then I'm not feeding more problems in the future right um, I think did that answer the question yeah I really think that um, you did I think that this temporary relief it really has to be temporary because because of the problems they cause and then if you're doing it then you have to do it with pharmaceutical exposure shot so that you minimize the poisons and how they affect you, probably also the toxic heavy metal exposure shot because they come loaded with those in them. You know, titanium dioxide and all kinds of other things like that are included in medication. So um, I would, you know, I would 100% say that that's part of your issue um, when you, if you're choosing to go down that path. But, you know, in my experience, I don't what I don't know what your experience is if you've had patients on a, a valciclovir or a ciclovir. They get better for like a month or maybe a bit more and then in every single case I've seen they get worse after that cuz then they're like well the medication isn't working anymore. Yeah. Is that do you think because of resistance or just Yeah, I think so and and it's again it's feeding other things, right? So that's that's the same story my patient who I had eventually, every time she had a break outbreak, I, I had to take her to the hospital to get an IV thing. And, and this is before I found medical medium. And I was just, I, I think I was feeding the problem, while making more resistance because right. it stopped, stopped working after a period of time. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does stop working after a period of time. So just bear that in mind. Um, so someone asks, Elaine asks, what about reducing high blood platelets? Can a blood draw help with this? How else does one reduce platelets? So, you know, when you have uh, thrombocytosis, they call it, right? Um, they usually think it's an inflammatory state, but if it continues, they call it this, whatever it is. Uh, think about the viral issue, right? You really want to knock the viruses down. Yeah, you can take blood out of you, but then at the same time, you're taking, I mean, the needles kind of adrenalizing and then taking blood out of you. If they only take the platelets out and they put it back, other back in, sure, you get some back, but it's going to be, the whole act of taking things out is stressful on the body. So um, working to thin the blood by eating cleaner, by knocking down viruses. Remember, 
you're a boxer in this, right? If you were a boxer and all you had was this, you would be you would be knocked out in a minute. You need the hook, you need the undercut, you need the stick and move, you need all the different protocols in there. When you're using herbs and supplements, they're not as strong as pharmaceuticals, but they're they're gentler and they get in and out faster. So you have to use them more often, um, unfortunately. And and it'd be nice if there was one pill we knock it out. It, it doesn't work that way. Trigeminal pain is probably other than pudendal pain, I would say trigeminal pain is the worst. So I really feel for you, Busy Lizzie. I've got many clients who have trigeminal neuralgia, trigeminal pain, and some are mild and some are not. And the ones that are not mild, these people are just struggling with pain. They're struggling to, they even have thoughts of, do I really want to be here? I'm in so much pain. And, you know, I would say perhaps better than valciclovir or an antiviral because you cannot beat the antivirals that are in the herbal remedy box from medical medium. I don't think there's better antivirals. But I think that as Dr. Fenn was also saying, like, you know, support the whole system, the pain. I think that is a better way because if I had to choose a drug I would choose it for that you know like what do you think Dr. Fan? Yeah so remember when you're in pain you're putting adrenaline out there you're, you're in a stressed state you know the virus yeah. is like feed me the, the viruses want you to be in pain so you're putting adrenaline out so it can eat the adrenaline so it's like pressing a button like if, every time we press this button here we get more adrenaline we're going to keep on pressing that button where that's a, like a, where this, the nerve is causing pain or whatever it's like oh yeah feed me feed me feed me so it's kind of this loop right so if you can break that loop using a medication, okay, fine. You'll take the, you know, take the the, the trade-offs basically. Um, but the adrenaline component is good. Then you can get some rest and you get some sleep and you can do these different things, knowing that you're going to continue to hit at the, you know, the root of the issue. And the root of high blood platelets is also viral. So there's yeah. a specific kind of Epstein bar that gets into the spleen and can throw your platelets off. Sometimes it's low platelets, sometimes it's high. Um, but high platelets can also mean that you have an infection going on or there's something. It, it, I mean, would you liken it? Do you often see, I, don't, I know that you don't always see high platelets along with high white blood cell counts, but. You can, yeah. You can see both in, in an inflammatory state, an acute inflammatory, inflammatory state, yeah. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. So um, I hope you all have been enjoying this conversation. Again, if you are interested in more of the same, check out this link up here, Ask the Doctor panel. We're doing four of these with amazing doctors and medical professionals who will be sharing about Paula Bennett, who's a nurse anesthetologist. She will be um, talking about surgeries and how to prep for them and what drugs to ask your doctor about, what kind of anesthesia to ask your doctor about, what other hidden ingredients do they put in your anesthesia, you know, questions like that and you'll get to ask questions to a psychiatrist about psychiatric drugs and using them and that's a powerful conversation more with dr fan what a powerful conversation we've had here today and then more from dr kibeli who will be talking about you know issues with urology and kidneys and bladders and and all of the issues women face with those things and men face too so i hope that you'll come along to that check this link out if you haven't already thank you for watching today dr fan thanks for your time your answers your wisdom your humor i know you're very beloved in our community and we really appreciate you you being a busy doctor having a full family life and giving us the time to um answer questions i'm sure we'll be doing more of this we want to invite dr fan again next month to our q a show if you guys like that, we will have him on again. And I hope you'll join us again as at that time because it really, you know, it, I hope you found this conversation helpful. If you did, let us know. Let us know what you liked about it. Let us know what you'd like to hear more of. And when, so if you put my post notifications on and subscribe to YouTube, and when we say, hey, we're gonna be doing this, I want you to be able to mark your calendars and be able to join. So that's really important and if you really want to stay on top of not missing a single show 
or a single notification about this, I'm I'm going to recommend that you um, you know that you uh, check out our newsletter. So if you have not yet signed up for the newsletter, um, it's I'm posting the link to the newsletter right here. And just bear with me while I find it. There's a newsletter link. You can sign up right there to the newsletter. Just click on it, sign up, and you will never miss a notification about our special events. Dr. Fan, thank you. Thank you for having me. We'll, we'll do this again sometime and hopefully get some more questions. Yes, we'll get to more questions. And, you know, we hope to, there's so many questions in this area. People have, so, or people want to know the truth and you're such a beacon of that. So we really appreciate it. Hit like and subscribe to mine or hers or in Anthony also, and stuff. And yes, go find him on MD with Spirit on YouTube and on Instagram. You should put that in your handle too. Next time we do this, oh, you should put your MD with spirit there so that people know where to find you. And um, if you're in Texas, he can actually, you can go see him in person and become a patient and have him support you with that. So I hope you will do that. And um, lots of love to everybody who came on and hung out with us. It was a joy to be here, a joy to connect. And uh, we'll do this again soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye now.